safe place to be yourself. Come to San Francisco, find acceptance. Give your real self permission. Well, I'm from Texas, a military city. I'm named after an Air Force base, which means my mother look, took a look at my tiny little baby face for the very first time and said to herself, Air Warfare. <laughs> Christmas bombings. Operation Rolling Thunder. Decades later, I would quit the Lone Star State and give myself permission to live longer. Fact, cradle to grave, a Texan's life is short. Just limited days filled with deadly thunderstorms and Dairy Queen Oreo blizzards. Mm -hmm. And corpulent men at the Home Depot with handguns wedged under their wet bellies, muttering to themselves, too many negras, migrants, feminists. Sanctuary city. Make this a sanctuary city for the unborn. Mm -hmm. Texas is 30th in U.S. life expectancy. In the insect world, they'd be houseflies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> California. California is fourth. So I came to be amongst the long-living cicadas and truly be who I am. <laughs> be an over-educated, busy-body, artsy, wine-dependent, anxiety-ridden, childless, single sister who looks like a cross between Halle Berry and Urkel. <laughs> I'm standing outside what could be my very first San Francisco address. Basement apartment, studio, $1,500. Inviting me inside is one of those witchy looking white women, red hair, see-through skin, pointy elf ears. I think they're glued on. Come in. She says like she wants to cook and eat me. I peek first to make sure the oven's not open and there's no oven, just a sink, a fridge, and one of those, I think they're called a hot plate, um, the plug-in stove that's used by Lexapro-loving divorced dads. <laughs> this place is dog crate small. Well, at least there's a window, so at least there's ventilation, but looking out from a basement is a little bit like rubbernecking out of your own grave. <laughs> you can always ask the landlord for security bars, she says. And now I'm thinking that this basement is a favorite of the Night Stalker. That it's on his single ladies home invasion tour. <laughs> then the witch elf hits me with, cats are allowed. <laughs> as though I want a litter box in this small space. I might as well buy a stinky candle, something scented with a toxoplasmosis. <laughs> Fresh stool. You know, cut out the middle cat. <laughs> You're not going to find a better price in this market, she says, then puts her hands on my shoulders in an almost motherly way. But I don't know how familiar you are with this neighborhood. You may want to walk around before you decide. I'll give you till sundown. As I'm walking back to Leavenworth Street, I think if I just killed her, I could improve my living options over that place. But when I Google it, it says it's three times bigger than a jail cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This neighborhood is the Tenderloin. It's more loin than tender. <laughs> it's a place with sex and drug sellers and sex and drug buyers. It's where the cops do the most drug busts in San Francisco. Crack, mostly, like it's the goddamn 80s. Mm -hmm. It's also the number one place for East Coast media to come and sneer and write stories about San Francisco becoming a shithole city. See that New York Times piece uh, called Life on the Dirtiest Block in San Francisco? It was Hyde Street, one of the 56 blocks that make up the Tenderloin. The New York paper rummaged through our heroin needles and side-eyed our trash and human excrement and people camped out on the sidewalks and they profiled this one tree that crackheads kept breaking branches from to clean out their crack pipes as though we aren't deforesting whole nations to print the New York Times. <laughs> Developing world squalor, they wrote. The city spends $70 million to clean these streets? Real judgy, I know. <laughs> then there was that New Yorker piece that compared San Francisco today to Paris in the 14th century, <laughs> during the bubonic plague, the Black Death, 
which killed half of Paris's population, a time with dead rats and deuces in the streets, when Frenchmen chucked out their chamber pots and vomited blood and popped boils on their crotches, and that Paris was still cleaner than San Francisco is now, they rejoiced, all this nasty poop. Well, my pops is a plumber, and I ask a thing or two about waste disposal, like, uh, why does a city with a housing problem have only 25 public toilets? There's more than 25 people outside. <laughs> This is one of those food-named places, like uh, Two Egg, Florida, Cookie Town, Oklahoma, Oatmeal, Texas. You know a tenderloin is a fancy-ass cut of beef, comes from right about here on the cow. <laughs> but San Francisco's tenderloin also has a weird association with a corrupt New York cop. It was the 1870s, and he was shaking down criminals and madams, and he got rich off of it, bragging, all my life I've been living on Chuck steak. It's about time I got me a piece of that tenderloin. The nickname stuck to the area he policed, went viral to grimy neighborhoods all over America. First reference to San Francisco's tenderloin is 1893. My potential neighbors are outside to meet me, help me marinate in that tenderloin. <laughs> Ooh, a sidewalk sale. That's not even the weekend. Um, DVD box set of The Office, the British version. Good taste, sir. <laughs> a Sony PlayStation that obviously doesn't work, and raw steaks. Uh, no, thank you. I don't have a refrigerator yet. I guess neither do you. Um, secondhand is the best recycling. This is fourth hand. A man comes toward me crossing the street, bent forward, cricked so deeply at the waist, he looks like a jig doll taking a bow, like he's going to face plant into the crosswalk. And sure enough, he takes a dive. I go over like the good Samaritan I am, just in time to see him stuffing something into the storm drain. A big black plastic trash bag. He's pushing it through the grates meant to catch leaves and pollution, like he's trying to stop up the sewer and drown the city in shit. Please, sir, don't do that, I say. He looks up at me. Lady, please mind your business. My mouth snaps shut. Things get curiouser. A cat passes me, riding on a dog. <laughs> a parade of little children appears, preschoolers in brightly colored shirts, and they're holding hands and chanting, kids coming through. Kids coming through! <laughs> and I noticed the dealers who had been calling out Roxy, Roxy, have fallen silent and hidden their Oxycontin because of the marchers. Kid power. <laughs> a man in a wheelchair comes up, booming music out of his back seat. The air vibrates with sound. And then it vibrates with smell. <laughs> As I have entered a place where everything is covered in urine. A human bouquet with notes of bladder stones, dehydration, UTIs. My eyes tear up from the ammonia, but I can still make out a sign taped to a parked car's window that says, no checkbook, no seat belt cutter, no California road atlas guide, no 40 caliber Sig Sauer handgun, not even an old french fry. There's nothing in this car. Please don't break the window. <laughs> <laughs> then I stumble upon the needles of San Francisco, as striking as the fountains of Rome. San Francisco gives out 400,000 new needles per month as part of a harm reduction program. Collecting a few pre-owns is a volunteer named Charlie. He's got on blue latex gloves, and he's the reincarnation of James Baldwin. He's picking up sharps and putting them into a little red cooler using a grabber like you'd see at the arcade with uh, that claw that grabs you a prize, except his prizes have leftover blood in the barrels and pokey stingers. I'm thinking about moving here, I tell him, but I'm not trying to walk through the needle pit trap in the Saw movies. He tenses. Do you know the risks associated with injecting drugs? Uh, disease? Like what? All of them? Mm -hmm. 
he looks at me with his big-eyed Baldwin pity. Hepatitis. HIV. Their transmission comes from sharing needles, reusing. Look, a number of people have a lot of feelings about drugs and doing them. But when we care about our neighbors, we don't just mean who's on top of the Salesforce tower. Did you know that when we keep our most marginalized communities healthy, they're more likely to enter treatment? He turns back to his work. Safe injection, that's in everyone's interest. Just then I hear a scream. I'm blind! These motherfuckers robbed me and I'm blind! I look over to where the robbery victim is and think about intervening, except there's a fight beside him. And it's between a late 20s white man and a late 70s white woman, and she's swinging a cane. And although there's 50 years between them, they're both going, come on, bitch, I'll fuck you up. Come on, bitch. <laughs> it always surprises me to see white people doing bad. <laughs> I mean, the government has protected them for so long, <laughs> saved the tricks and needle traps for the rest of us. I decide to go the opposite direction and almost miss a pit bull in a planter box where you put a tree. And it's looking at me with such concern, such empathy, like he's a social worker. <laughs> and he wants to offer me a voucher to help pay my rent. Beneath a dog on the sidewalk is a man cocooned in stained sheets. The wind flutters one and I see a leg and an untreated flesh-eating disease. A chunk of his calf is missing. Dear Lord, forgive a bitch, I'm about to run. But he makes eye contact with me and says, what job do you have? As though he wants to know how I got health care for my uneaten legs. Just then I hear a woman's voice in my ear, warm and husky. Just smile and nod politely. I turn to see a solidly built woman with a cane, and she's got this gentle presence like an animatronic bear at the Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Just smile, she says, taking my elbow and leading me away. Every San Franciscan knows you get that one day where every crazy person in town talks to you and thinks that you're their special friend. They'll all have vital information just for you. Because it's San Francisco, most will be harmless, which is to say they won't have weaponry on them. They may not smell so good or look so healthy, but you can't ignore them. No, you can't do that. Or else you'll get two days in a row. <laughs> Just say, oh, fuck, it's my day. Her name is Karen Taylor, and before she says farewell, she points me down Ellis Street and says there's something I should see. And when I get there, I'm startled. It's a tall red gate, like you'd expect to see outside of a temple for kung fu monks. You want to go inside? A voice from the gallery next door calls out, and out comes a man, looks like a skater, introduces himself as Daryl Smith, unlocks the gate, and lets me inside a very cared for space. It's the Tenderloin National Forest. It's not a federal forest, it's a, an alley a fire lane between hotels, but it's green with benches and trees and murals of brown faces to admire. And whoever made this place must believe in the goodness of people. My dad was a cop. We were in the Ingleside. And my earliest memory of this place was he was driving us across town and all sorts of people were outside. And he was like, you don't ever want to end up here which is kind of ironic because I've devoted most of my creative and artistic life to this place, Daryl says, and then goes and fiddles with the leaves of a ginkgo tree that gets stronger every year it survives, he says. Then he points to a redwood right here in the dingy heart of the city. We thought we had committed a crime when we planted that redwood in 1999 because it really struggled. Me and my partner, we were on a panel with a landscape architect out of UC Berkeley named Walter Hood. And his thing was to design parks that were inclusive for everyone, no matter what level you were in life, that there was a place for you. That was the inspiration for how this place evolved, put in an orno over there, baked pizzas, no meat, all vegetarian. This is for the people who live in the Tenderloin. And you know it's one of the more maligned neighborhoods in America, given its population and relatively small size. 
people get forwarded here from other cities and counties because of San Francisco's big budget, which is over $12 billion now. People with psychiatric issues and fierce outdoors people who can't conform to interior living. But you can't judge them. You can't say, oh, it's your fault because of something you did. Some people are escaping domestic issues and drug issues, which are rampant. Nonetheless, people deserve the opportunity to evolve. And this Tenderloin National Forest is to signify that. Wow, this place is a green pleasure. And it makes me think, what am I doing to hold anybody up? The people that live here, they've been kicked in the tail by life, dismissed as irresponsible, immoral, too low to even be loved. But sometimes you can be what a place needs. Bring it your light or your fight, especially when it's in disarray. I know that Tenderloin has this unbroken connection to its history as a vice district. But to me, it also has this visceral link to America's failings, her discrimination problem, her substance abuse problem, her inequality problem. Spending a little bit of time here feels like the Tenderloin deserves and does not deserve its reputation. I know what you're thinking. You spent some time there. You're saying, oh, no, 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 Kelly Air Force Base. You're wrong. The Tenderloin has gotten worse. So has the ocean. So has the White House. So has the internet. What are you going to do about it? You know I'm not the type of lady to mind your business, so I'm going to tutor at the Tenderloin Elementary School or help women organizing at their hotels tell their stories, maybe make a map of places in the Tenderloin they think you should see, the drag bars, the welcoming churches, the safe places to be no matter where you are in life. That lease. I made my way back to the basement apartment, my feet are at its window, and I turn up to a sky that's turning the color of heroin. A red light beams down on everyone who has hunted for something and made it through another day in San Francisco. Right then, a Charles Manson lookalike comes and stands beside me, and he's combing his hair with a fork, and he also looks skyward. And then at me, and grins. And in that moment, I feel myself truly being seen. And he says, you look like a clown. <laughs> and I just smile and nod politely. 